So, Professor Kachinovsky, you are Ukrainian and Canadian political scientist. You teach at the School of Political Studies at the University of Ottawa. Previously, you were at the Davis Center at Harvard University for Russian and Eurasian Studies. You are a visiting professor at SUNY Potsdam, a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto, a postdoctoral fellow at the Kluge Center at the Library of Congress and you received your PhD from the Shar School of Policy at George Mason University. So you described the censorship of your latest work on Twitter as Orwellian, quote in 1984, that if all others accepted the lie which the party imposed, if all records told the same tale, then the lie passed into history and became truth. Who controls the past, ran the party slogan, controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. We see this constantly when we are told by our Western officials who reflexively insist that this current war in Ukraine was unprovoked, despite the fact that it was very provoked and very predictable. For many years, people like John Mersheimer, Stephen F. Cohen, George Kennan predicted that NATO expansion would lead to this exact outcome. And of course, we know because of this website called WikiLeaks, that our Western officials knew that NATO expansion to Ukraine was a red line, not just for Putin, but for every single political faction in the Russian foreign policy establishment. Professor, why is it so important for those who are prosecuting this proxy war that nobody knows what precipitated this conflict? In addition to very famous Orwell uh, sayings about uh, uh, propaganda and truth, we also have a very famous... Uh, Kind of, uh, saying that uh, truth is the first casualty of the war. So now we're witnessing this, uh, that uh, truth became a casualty of war in Ukraine. And I uh, use this uh, dictum in my uh, book, which was just uh, censored basically by a uh, British uh, publisher, and also used in other publications and other academic studies about this war. So it's very clear that in addition to the Russian propaganda and disinformation, which is uh, kind of presented in the West as the only propaganda and disinformation, we also have uh, propaganda and disinformation by the Ukrainian government, which is um, and media, and also we have also disinformation and propaganda by Western governments in the media. And for this reason, it is necessary to understand the war in Ukraine just by determining what actually going on based on actual evidence and not based on these narratives promoted by the Russian, Ukrainian or Western governments in the media. And for this reason, I think this is uh, I think a very important issue. A lot of people do not understand this, but this is kind of a fact of uh, this war. And there were similar situations before, like the most famous case was war in Iraq, which was based on a false uh, pretext that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. And I was then in the United States, and I saw this media coverage, which was kind of also Orwellian, because there was no evidence of such weapons of mass destruction, but all the media, including New York Times and so on, presented this basically as a fact. So we now see the same kind of, or very similar kind of um, propaganda and disinformation going on about war in Ukraine. Professor, I was taught in my Russian studies and political science education that there is no single correct history, that history ought to be subject to constant debate and revision, um, and that when there's a uniform effort to write history, to rewrite it, just to produce the right political story, that that's actually a problem. I remember reading about a movement to decolonize the field of Russian studies. It's based on the idea that Russia is the supreme evil force in Eastern European history. And I remember reading this when I was in uh, college, and the argument seemed to downplay a number of historical facts, like the role the Red Army played in defeating Nazi Germany, in order to make a politically convenient historical argument to draw up support for our current war with Russia via Ukraine as our proxy. Have you seen an effort in academia to revise history, to downplay certain historical events and promote others in order to manufacture animosity toward Russia and support for this current war? Yes, and I saw this as a part of my research and I published this about, about this kind of tendency in my academic studies. And this concerns uh, World War II, as you mentioned, which is now basically presented as a kind of 
in a very uh, biased and very kind of unconventional way. And uh, this also had a kind of manifestation in what happened in the Ukrainian parliament when there was standing ovation given by, the, uh, by basically by uh, all the Ukrainian government, uh, including by Minister of Canada, by the entire Ukrainian parliament, and by Zelensky and members of his government to veteran of SS Galicia division. And I after I saw this after I published a tweet about this because I researched this division and mass uh, massacres which it committed or which uh, whose members committed such massacre in, including in my high school in Western Ukraine. This tweet became viral and this led to media coverage and this led uh, basically to apology from Canadian politicians from um, about this event. But Zelensky stayed silent about this uh, uh, quite uh, revealing and quite important manifestation of what can actually history can be uh, misrepresented or, or whitewashed. And, and uh, this is, I think, there is such an effort in Ukraine to whitewash this division, to whitewash Nazi collaborators uh, in, um, from uh, this Gal uh, SS Galicia division from Oun and UPA, and uh, also whitewash or deny their involvement in mass murder during World War II. Because they were Nazi collaborators, they uh, they were involved in massacres, but they are misrepresented as heroes of Ukraine. The similar tendency is in the West, basically, which concerns World War II, but also much more recent events, which I also research in particular Maidan massacre, which is uh, misrepresented as a uh, basically violence uh, committed by uh, Yanukovych government forces, even so all the evidence suggests to the, so shows this was not the case, that this was a massacre, for flag massacre com perpetrated by opposition members, including uh, far-right uh, um, organizations in Ukraine and oligarchic uh, elements of Ukrainian opposition at the time. And also this concerns war in Donbass, which is misrepresented as a uh, war between Russia and Ukraine. Even so, this was a civil war with Russian military interventions. And so, so and this also concerns the current war in Ukraine. So this is quite a kind of uh, revealing and important tendency. So I want to break those down because they expect us to have a very short memory in order us, for us to believe this propaganda. And so I think it's very important for us to revisit the record on a number of the points you raised, starting with the idea that there are neo-Nazis currently in Ukraine that the U.S. government is sending trucks full of weapons to. Um, we were told that these types virtually did not exist in Ukraine, and that saying that there were neo-Nazi elements embedded in Ukrainian nationalism, that that was parroting Putin propaganda. I remember reading an article in the New York Times in June of 2023, which finally talked about what they called Ukraine's thorny issues of history. And they said that even Jewish groups and anti-hate organizations that have traditionally called out hateful symbols have stayed largely silent about these neo-Nazi symbols that everyone has seen on the front lines. Privately, some leaders have worried about being seen as embracing Russian propaganda talking points. That was the New York Times. And of course, as you mentioned, the Canadian Parliament gave a standing ovation to a 98-year-old immigrant from Ukraine who actually fought in the Third Reich military formation accused of war crimes, as people like yourself and Lev Galinkin have published about. So... What extent is there neo-Nazi elements still today in the war effort? And to what extent did it influence Ukraine's uh, nationalism movement? Again, I research the uh, issue of far right in Ukraine, in Ukraine including neo-Nazis in Ukraine for more than 20 years, which is my main area of research. I specialize in political violence, conflicts, and uh, specifically by far right in Ukraine, and I research far right formations, including UNUPA, uh, and now modern uh, uh, far right organizations, and say the moment in uh, Maidan massacre in the one in Donbass, and so on. So I can say, based on, and I also research uh, politics of media coverage of Ukraine. So for me, this is not accidental. This is the same uh, kind of tendency, which is very clear. Kind of uh, how media and uh, Western governments misrepresent uh, far right in Ukraine because before uh, actually 2014, before the Maidan overthrow of uh, Yanukovych government in Ukraine, Ukraine was presented in the American media basically as a kind of as um, and Ukrainians were uh, uh, presented as often as Nazi collaborators uh, during World War II, uh, again involvement in Holocaust and so on. 
and even so, most of the majority of Ukrainians actually were fighting against Nazis in the Soviet army, and about uh, six um, or more than actually six million of Ukrainians, about seven million of, uh, of uh, residents of Ukraine, including millions of Ukrainians, were massacred by and uh, or killed or perished as a result of Nazi genocidal policies. But this was a kind of a tendency to portray Ukraine in such a way. But this all changed uh, since 2014, and especially after Russian invasion in 2022, which led uh, to kind of total whitewashing and total rebranding of open neo-Nazis in Ukraine as a freedom fighters, similar to what uh, was the case with um, uh, Mujahideen, in, uh, and who later became a Taliban and Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, and similar to what was in uh, after World War II with Oun and UPA, which uh, were used by Western governments against the Soviet Union. Uh, so in this case, uh, it, it is very important to understand what the Russian propaganda and uh, narrative is about far right in Ukraine, including neo-Nazis, because Russia uh, claims, falsely claims that Ukraine is neo-Nazi state, that Nazis basically are in power in Ukraine, that uh, there was a fascist or Nazi coup in Ukraine in 2014, and this is uh, not the case. I can say this is based on my research. Uh, this is, uh, again, uh, disinformation and propaganda in order, uh, which is used by Russia to justify illegal invasion of Ukraine in 2022. But uh, the narrative which is promoted by Western governments in the media and, and other politicians, and including also, <coughs> and also by Ukrainian government and, and media, is that uh, basically there are no neo-Nazis in Ukraine, that uh, the, they became uh, kind of now moderate, uh, they uh, kind of that this all uh, uh, neo-Nazi led formations like Azov became uh, totally kind of under control of Ukrainian um, forces or Ukrainian governments, that they have no longer associated with Nazi or neo-Nazi ideology. So this narrative is also false because this is uh, uh, not based on any evidence, it's based on uh, politics, political considerations. And I just published recently peer review journal article along with uh, uh, Mark uh, Adams, a professor from the uh, United States, who also specialized in terrorism, about this uh, far right and the involvement in Odessa massacre in 2014, and also the involvement in uh, war in Donbass. And I had a book chapter also in my new book, which was um, just uh, basically uh, Rutledge uh, refuses, uh, refuses to publish, which also examines far right in uh, involvement in uh, in the current war in Ukraine. And uh, in all this evidence, beyond any doubt, says that the, this uh, formations, which are led by open neo-Nazis, including Azov brigades and other units, uh, they are kind of still under a formal, oh, sorry, informal control of these organizations and even formal control of formal command because Azov, one of the Azov brigades is led by a founder of neo-Nazi a movement who was uh, again who said that uh, mission of historical mission of white people is kind of and so on using a kind of anti-semitic anti uh, kind of is to let uh, things struggle against uh, kind of uh, semitic led uh, intervention or something like this so he used this openly neo-nazi kind of um, and uh, racist ideology and ideas and and still Many of the members, very large number of members of this Azov formations and units and other and veterans of these formations and units, they openly use neo-Nazi symbols, they use swastika, they use Adolf Hitler, uh, again, uh, portraits and references, they use SS uh, sign, they use um, other uh, kind of um, uh, other neo-Nazi elements, including uh, uh, the official symbol, which is based on neo-Nazi symbol. And so this is uh, quite unbelievable because all the evidence is available, but actually now modern media uh, in the United States, media and politicians misrepresent them as uh, freedom fighters and claim falsely that they are not neo-Nazis. And uh, there was even an uh, amendment which was adopted anonymously by U.S. Congress in uh, a few years after 2014, which uh, prohibited uh, finding and training of um, this neo-Nazi battalion, um, Azov battalion. But now the State Department basically said that they are no longer 
subjected to this amendment because uh, they change and they are under command even so this is uh, under new command even so this is totally false so this is just politics which is very important to understand there is a division kind of the same what i mentioned propaganda and disinformation by, by russia but also propaganda and disinformation by the west by the western governments in media and by ukrainian governments in the media and you talk a lot in your book the Maidan Massacre in Ukraine, which is the first scholarly book to actually analyze comprehensively what actually happened at the Maidan Massacre in Ukraine. Uh, it's open access, and it will be linked below. It's based on more than 10 years of your research into that massacre and the trials and investigations of that killings. And you place central importance on these groups, such as the right sector and the Svoboda Party, the far-right Svoboda Party in Ukraine, in perpetrating that massacre. And you point to the forensic evidence, which shows that these protesters were shot from high altitudes, likely from the Music Conservatory and Hotel Ukraina, which were under the control at the time of those uh, Maidan protesters, anti-government protesters, not the Berkut police, who the Western media after Maidan jumped to blame for the massacre, forcing Yanukovych to flee with the help of people like Joe Biden and Barack Obama, who pressured him explicitly to do so. And so who is behind that massacre? And why, why hasn't the Western media updated any of its narratives about it, given all the evidence that's come out ever since? Why have there been no corrections? So yes, I think uh, I mean, this is another very important issue which I researched uh, since uh, this massacre was uh, going on. I was watching this live. When it happened, so because again I specialize in political violence in Ukraine, so I researched this uh, since, um, and I still research. I found even new evidence after I published my book uh, by uh, Palgrave Macmillan, which is major British academic press, and um, which is also open access book, uh, which I uh, use also Go uh, GoFundMe me uh, campaign to crowdfund uh, open access fee to make it bo this book uh, accessible to people. Um, uh, freely. Basically, it now has already close to 200,000 views and downloads of the text or individual chapters of the book or entire book. So in my book, I present all the overwhelming evidence which shows beyond any doubt that this massacre was committed not by uh, uh, police forces or any other government units, specifically snipers by uh, Yanukovych government or any uh, kind of another force uh, linked to um, Yanukovych or any other uh, foreign country like uh, Russia, but this massacre was committed by members of opposition, uh, by Maidan opposition, specifically to blame uh, uh, this uh, violence on Yanukovych and his forces in order to save his power. And this massacre was perpetrated with involvement of uh, far-right organizations and oligarchic elements of Maidan opposition uh, using uh, snipers who were located uh, in buildings which are controlled by Maidan opposition, which you already mentioned. And this evidence includes uh, several hundred uh, testimonies by witnesses, eyewitnesses about this um, there are also testimonies by absolute majority of uh, wounded Maidan activists who testified at the Ukrainian trial and investigation in Ukraine that they were shot uh, by snipers who were located in Hotel Ukraina and other buildings which were controlled by Maidan opposition and not by the Berkut police members who are charged with this massacre who were located in front of them and uh, on the similar ground level. There were also medical forensic examinations which show that almost all uh, Maidan activists were shot and killed or wounded from a very top uh, and bottom, oh, sorry, very top direction of, and from the side uh, direction and not from the front direction. So this also matches this buildings which are controlled by Maidan opposition. And there are videos of such snipers shooting from uh, this business and uh, and this business controlled by the Maidan opposition, including by far right group of Maidan snipers in Hotel Ukraina. So this is all the evidence which I presented in my book. And in addition to this, there are a lot of other testimonies which I examine, and specifically all the evidence, key evidence disappeared, a video uh, recordings disappeared uh, uh, from uh, meetings which, which were controlled by Maidan opposition, bullets disappeared from uh, bodies of uh, protesters who were uh, killed or wounded, and also uh, their shields and helmets also disappeared. But the narrative 
I was promoted again for political uh, reasons because this was a violent overthrow of the Ukrainian government. So in the West, in order not to admit this, this was presented as a kind of democratic revolution, popular, uh, popular protest, peaceful one. And they denied existence of any snipers. They denied uh, uh, any kind of um, uh, evidence of uh, existence of such snipers or any other evidence of post flag massacre, even so evidence is overwhelming. And even recently, Maidan massacre trial in Ukraine issued a verdict which stated that uh, many Maidan protesters were killed uh, or wounded from, uh, from locations which were controlled by Maidan opposition, in particular Hotel Ukraina, and they stated this hotel was controlled by Maidan opposition. The same would uh, concern also Music conservative from which uh, Maidan snipers also shot and killed and wounded many police members. So this is quite unprecedented to see such evidence publicly available, but the media uh, uh, does not report this because obviously this is politically inconvenient. Uh, this would undermine all this narrative about the conflict in Ukraine and actually show that people who are presented in the West as a kind of a leading democratic revolution or peaceful protest in Ukraine actually were the ones who were involved in mass murder in order to seize power illegally in Ukraine via uh, this false flag massacre. And, uh, and evidence, I think, it's very clear, but uh, and for this reason, now there is a tactic basically to remain silent about this event. So I published my book, which uh, and published also CPR review journal articles about this uh, massacre. But again, uh, there is total silence about this. All misrepresentation continues. Also, there are people who openly kind of. Um, deny still all the evidence or they claim that this never happened and so on even they claim that verdict did not state that or did not reveal or confirm a presence of such snipers in hotel Ukraine and so on which is quite incredible to see uh, op that they do they do this openly because this is whitewashing of mass murders and and misrepresentation of the key event which have led to all subsequent conflicts in Ukraine to uh, the Russian accession of Crimea, which took place afterwards, to the war in Donbass, uh, which was civil war with the Russian military interventions, and finally uh, escalated uh, to illegal invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia, which is now became also proxy war between uh, Russia and the West in Ukraine. So I want to ask about one of the arguments that you are currently being censored for, and it concerns your analysis of who was behind what was really the most serious act of industrial terrorism this century, the detonation of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And really, I think this is one of the most brazen and shameless propaganda efforts I've ever seen. Perhaps you agree. Immediately after the explosion, you had corporate media and Western officials blaming Russia for the explosion, arguing that they had basically destroyed their own pipeline in a false flag attack. There were many obvious reasons to instantly disbelieve those claims. I mean, firstly, why would Russia blow up its own pipeline that cost them billions of dollars? What interest is there at all for them to do that? There was plenty of interest for the United States to do that. And in fact, as you have written, U.S. officials threatened to do exactly that, among them Victoria Nuland and Joe Biden, who as recently as February 7th, 2022, just days before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, said that, quote, if Russia invades Ukraine, there will be no Nord Stream 2. And then Putin invaded, and a few months, there was no Nord Stream 2 anymore, as Joe Biden had promised. And so if anyone needed more evidence that the U.S. blew up the pipeline, there's a recent report from September of this year. It's testimony from the harbor master at the site of the explosion who admits that he saw U.S. Navy ships near and around the pipeline at the time of the explosion. And that report has, of course, been universally ignored by corporate media, our disinformation experts and fact checkers. You have to go to the Danish political magazine Politiken to find that information. But if you go to the corporate media to explain this, you get called a Putin apologist or a Russian disinformation agent. Or in your case, you're not allowed to publish. Professor, are the disinformation experts in corporate media wrong? Are they the ones who are really spreading disinformation about what happened to Nord Stream 2? So actually all this disinformation industry is just part of the propaganda industry. There is no other way to say because you have people who have no 
knowledge about the issues in which they become kind of experts. They are presented basically as fact checkers and they determine what is the information and what is not. Even so, for me, this requires a lot of research, so I have to look into evidence and so on. And you see some people who kind of uh, basically proclaim as some kind of uh, kind of a uh, supreme uh, kind of uh, authority what happened actually in Ukraine even so all evidence is publicly available like in case of Maidan Massacre or even no steam so this is uh, just uh, I regard them as a part of disinformation and there was similar kind of a system in the Soviet Union so this also kind of uh, flush back to the Soviet Union times and in the case of non steam this is another example of blatant uh, propaganda disinformation because the media and politicians after this explosion uh, explosions took place um, immediately uh, basically presented a conspiracy theory about false flag massacre by Russia without any evidence even so, before this, they uh, claim that um, any existence of false flag massacres or any false flag operations was uh, just conspiracy theory. They uh, use this term to deny a Maidan massacre. Even so, there was overwhelming evidence, including admissions by uh, 14 members of Maidan snipers groups in uh, videos and documentaries and uh, testimonies to Maidan massacre trial, including um, other evidence, including uh, statements by uh, 10 uh, Maidan uh, senior members of Maidan leadership or senior Maidan activists about the involvement of Maidan opposition. So they they uh, denied this uh, kind of uh, false flag Maidan massacre, but they immediately presented a false flag uh, conspiracy theory about North Stream uh, bombing by Russia, which was again politically convenient and there was no evidence whatsoever and it made no rational sense to do this because Russia could uh, just have sh could have just shut down this North Stream without actually blowing up this uh, very expensive pipeline. pipeline. So all the evidence which I examined, which I cited in my book, actually points to involvement of um, both the United States and Ukrainian, um, and Ukrainian involvement, uh, Ukrainian uh, special services involvement in this operation, because there was, in addition to what you mentioned, evidence which I also cited in my book, um, which was, uh, again, basically uh, refuses, uh, which Rutledge refuses to publish for political reasons uh, in uh, censorship, specifically because of uh, no steam um, analysis, which I did. Actually, uh, I included also an article by uh, uh, famous uh, American uh, investigative reporter, Sam Hersh, uh, in um, his article about U.S. government involvement, but also uh, there is an official investigation by a German government and also by German media based on this investigation, by German government and also uh, by German police, and also investigation by their own uh, leading German media and other media, which you mentioned, Dutch, uh, Danish media from Denmark. They all show that there was also involvement of uh, not only uh, basically United States, um, but also involvement of Ukrainian, uh, uh, Ukrainian special forces, and they even name people who were involved in this operation. And uh, so I think uh, what I mentioned in my book, it's possible to reconcile these two events very, uh, kind of, uh, in a very clear way. So there is such possibility that U.S. involvement or Ukrainian involvement does not exclude involvement of U.S. or U.K. Uh, because uh, this can be done together as a part of this operation in which Ukrainian uh, special forces might have been used uh, specifically to distract Kind of, or to kind of, how to say, to be a, a decoy, a kind of uh, using uh, for uh, this operation to blame them for this uh, for this operation because uh, basically Ukrainian special forces are under de facto uh, kind of a patronage of the United States, and this was revealed by uh, again Western media, by New York Times uh, and other major Ukrainian media publications that Ukrainian special uh, services are uh, kind of trained and equipped and funded and also uh, advised by Western uh, kind of uh, intelligence services so in this and US in services in particular so so this is why I think very clear that there was uh, evidence of uh, kind of this such evidence clear evidence of US involvement but also Ukrainian involvement but there is no evidence of Russian involvement uh, but uh, Rutledge told me that I have to include all um, opinion about this uh, North Stream bombing uh, which means that I have to include uh, kind of Russian involvement basically in this uh, for, in this uh, North Stream bombing even so there was no evidence there was um, kind of no rational incentive to do this no uh, basically 
it might as well be Brazilian involvement or you have to include Indonesian involvement. It makes no sense. Yes, yeah, so like Chinese or some alien involvement. So in this case, I said this would be a conspiracy theory and I could not, I said to them I could not commit such academic fraud because this is kind of would go against any integrity, go against all the evidence. So I uh, basically... Uh, kind of this is also quite unbelievable because you have uh, uh, my book was um, uh, kind of recommended for publication by two uh, experts who are uh, experts in this area who provided anonymous um, again uh, kind of who were anonymous for me but because this is a very kind of a typical system anonymous peer review but uh, who recommended publication of my book without any substantial changes and now Rutledge basically said uh, what I have to write. Uh, kind of, I am an expert, Ukrainian expert, one actually of a few Ukrainian uh, scholars in the West, in the Western academia who specializes in researching um, conflicts in Ukraine. Uh, but again, uh, this is also quite unbelievable to see and witness uh, because academia also became kind of a place in which uh, uh, evidence is regarded as not as important now in many cases, especially in Ukrainian studies as you uh, kind of as it's supposed to be because science needs to be based on evidence and not just on ideology or political narratives what i find so interesting is that you were censored in a way in the soviet union when you wrote your thesis which presciently predicted that the soviet union would collapse and today you're being censored again not by the soviet union but by the western academic press and you are of course ukrainian and no one seems to be listening to uh to you the same seems to be true for actual Ukrainians who now, according to Gallup, a majority oppose or a majority want an immediate end to the war, an immediate ceasefire. I mean, everyone has seen these videos of vans abducting people and sending them to the front lines. It's going on constantly, and everyone can see it in the West. How come Western media and people who cheerlead for this proxy conflict to continue, how come they ignore the actual views of your of Ukrainians, polling and the views of people like yourself? Uh, because this is, I think, very simple and uh, explanation, which I think uh, uh, kind of uh, is obvious also explanation. Because they are not interested in Ukraine or Ukrainians; they are just interested in using Ukraine and Ukrainians as a proxy uh, to fight or kind of uh, clients, basically to fight uh, Russia. Or to weaken Russia. So this is a goal, kind of U.S. policy under Biden administration, which was officially proclaimed by uh, head of Pentagon at the start of war. And this is why uh, the peace deal, which was very close to being uh, finalized in spring of 2022, was also blocked by the Western governments, by U.S. and British governments. And also all this um, kind of media narrative and uh, kind of also campaign to say that uh, there is a supporting, uh, there is need to support Ukraine or Ukrainians actually uh, is just um, a tool or um, a kind of a way to justify continuation of this proxy war and using Ukrainians as a tool against Russia without any prospect or any real prospect of, of defeating Russia. And, uh, this, and this would uh, this leads actually to tremendous uh, casualties in Ukraine, uh, very kind of devastating consequences to Ukraine. But nobody, uh, but there is very little concern in the West about this, very little reporting in the West about this, or about Ukrainian casualties. You have almost no kind of uh, data about such casualties, even so they are very big, uh, very large one, and very significant including in um, my native western Ukraine, but um, there is also almost no reporting about uh, forced mobilization in Ukraine, which has taken place, uh, thousands of videos of forced mobilization, but again, the, the, uh, there is almost no coverage about this in the West. And so basically the policy is to use Ukraine and Ukrainians to justify this um, kind of uh, proxy war and continuation of this war, which is detrimental to interest of Ukraine and Ukrainians because peace deal was the best solution. For this reason only, uh, for this reason, media and governments, you can only hear voices of Ukrainians who just follow this uh, narrative, who promote this narrative. Uh, even when they open neo-Nazis, uh, like for Azov, they are given uh, interviews to New York Times, to other leading Western media. They are invited to, like Pentagon, to other uh, government uh, uh, top, they met with top uh, politicians and government officials in the West. 
while anybody from Ukraine who does not support this proxy war, uh, because this is again a very devastating consequences to Ukraine, is immediately kind of denied any uh, opportunity to present such views, even like academic as me who researches this uh, war, who has no ties with Russia or kind of uh, I, uh, who supported kind of um, the Western orientation, if you can, including membership of UK in European Union, but not NATO, and uh, supported uh, free freedom and democracy uh, in Ukraine at the time when only a few uh, dozen people uh, attended such a first uh, demo kind of opposition demonstration in Kiev in 1988, in which I attended myself. So again, uh, this uh, kind of now, kind of... Uh, this all ignored, and basically only if you follow narrative, if you kind of present what is expected uh, to be uh, kind of uh, supporting this narrative about uh, and justify, and also which would be used to justify why in Ukraine continuing this war, then you have Ukrainian voices. If you are not supporting this, uh, even now it becomes very clear, even in academic media, not only in the media, not only in among politicians, but also. Among academic publishers like Rutledge, which is supposed to be independent and supposed to rely on evidence, not kind of on politics, now there are no Ukrainian voices, uh, basically a very limited number of Ukrainian voices who are able even to express such views openly. And for this reason, kind of I'm uh, kind of I'm not surprised to see such a reaction 